Hello, grade 10s. Shortly, we'll be joining Eloise as she looks at patterns in nature and in the world around us. Let's join her now. Hi, my name is Eloise. Welcome to the series on number patterns. In this lesson, we will explore patterns in the world around us. Have you ever taken time out in your busy life to stop and wonder at the way your life and the world around you is organized? Now you are probably thinking to yourself, organized, yeah right. But if you look closely, you will see that there are organized patterns just about anywhere you look. There is order in the seasons, the way that summer changes to autumn, to winter, to spring. In the petals of a flower or the leaves of a fern. I'm going to take you on a journey through patterns. I want to show you the beauty and the purpose of these patterns. We'll start in the streets of Jersey, a place that might surprise you with its hidden patterns that lie in the busy and constant movement of the traffic. Then we'll move to a more tranquil and remote setting, the seaside, to watch the wave patterns. The waves break on the shore in never-ending cycles. Then from the sea to the African honeybee. We will take a close look at the life of this bee to find some extraordinary patterning that bees use. Let's go back to the city and see what patterns we can find. Ah, here we go. We found one already. Have a look at the girl who is waiting to cross at this intersection. With a glance at the lights for both the intersecting streets, she can predict when the traffic light will change for her so that it is safe to cross the road. This is a pattern she probably uses every day and I'm sure many of you have used it too. Next time you are in the city, look out for some more patterns in the traffic, on the roads or on the pavements. You'll be surprised at what patterns emerge from something that looks so disorganized. Let's move away from the city and take a look at a more relaxed situation down at the coast. Have you noticed how the waves swell at some point offshore and then build up until they break on the shore? The waves roll in and break in some kind of pattern as if they've been carefully organized to do this. You may have heard people speak about the pattern of waves. Some people say that every seventh wave is larger than the others. Others believe that when the moon is full, the waves are bigger than at other times. Divers come to know the sea very well. They use the patterns of waves to predict when it is safer to enter the water from the beach. Craig Warner is a sport diving instructor. He has been diving for many years and teaches divers how to use the patterns of the ocean to enter the ocean safely from the shore. Wave patterns are affected by the wind blowing over the water and the secondary effect that, they, that will have on wave patterns will be the moon as gravitational pull on the earth and when the sun and the moon align that will then create a larger wave pattern as well. well for us to enter the ocean we're looking at the wave sets and they will come to us in different sizes with the small uh, the wave accumulating in size until eventually reaching the largest size. That set can be um, waves of three with the third one being the largest, five with the fifth one being the largest, seven and nine running up to the largest. We obviously want to enter when the wave is at its smallest. So we'll wait for the largest wave to come in and then we'll enter the water. Remembering that we have to keep a fair amount of heavy equipment on our back and we don't particularly want to end up damaging ourselves by miscalculating um, what the pattern was. It's not only divers who use patterns in nature to help them make decisions. Through the ages, people have used patterns in the weather, in the temperature and the landscape of a country to make decisions. For example, a farmer observes patterns in the weather and uses this to decide when to plant and harvest crops. But it's not only people who have learned to use the patterns in nature to their benefit. The African honeybee is another creature whose entire existence is governed by patterns. If we take a look inside the beehive, we can only marvel at the architectural genius of this creation. The shape of the opening of a single cell of the honeycomb is a regular hexagon. The honeycomb itself consists of a network of adjacent hexagonal cells. 
A surface view of a honeycomb reveals a beautiful pattern of tessellated hexagons. But why do the bees choose this shape for their honeycomb? Why didn't they make triangular cells? Why didn't they choose to use a pentagon or an octagon shape? Who would think that the answer to this question lies in the patterns that shapes can make? Let me explain. The queen bee's body and the larvae are both cylindrical. So a circular cell structure would be the best choice to fit the shapes of the queen bee and the larva. There would be no waste of space inside the cells. The problem is that circular shapes don't tessellate. There is too much space in between adjacent circles. The bees would have to make extra wax to fill the spaces between the cells and strengthen the structure of the network of cells. This will be a waste of their resources. What about using a shape that is close to the shape of the circle? Like an octagon. Let's try it and see what it does. An octagon has eight sides and is pretty close to the shape of a circle. The bee and her larvae should fit the shape quite well. But if we try to tessellate the octagons, there is still a lot of space between the cells. Let's choose a shape with fewer sides, like the pentagon. When you try to tessellate pentagons, you get a pattern like this. There is still quite a lot of wasted space between the shapes. The bees will be kept busy making enough wax to fill the holes. Now let's see why the hexagon works so well. Isn't it amazing how they fit with each other without any spaces in between? A perfect tessellation. The hexagon has enough sides to give the bees an almost circular space inside the cells and no wax is wasted in filling gaps between the cells. A brilliant design. Researchers who have studied the male population of the African honeybee have recorded another very interesting pattern. The male honeybee is called a drone. He has one important purpose in his life and that is to fertilize the eggs laid by the queen bee. Those eggs that are fertilized develop into female bees called worker bees. Those eggs that remain unfertilized develop into male drones. What this means is that male bees fertilize eggs which can then only develop into female bees. We could represent this in a diagram like this. Male fertilizes egg to create female. Female bees lay eggs that develop into either male or female bees. Female lays eggs which become male or female. This male again fertilizes eggs that can only become females, while the female lays eggs that become either male bees or female bees. Have you seen that a pattern is beginning to be created here? Let's go to the next step of the pattern. This male can also only produce females, and both these females can produce both males and females. Now let's look at the whole diagram. What we have in this diagram could be described as the family tree of this male bee up to the fifth generation. We could continue creating this pattern for male and female bees, adding a generation of bees each time. Now this gets interesting in a mathematical way. Look at the total number of bees in each generation. If we write down this number sequence, it will be 1, then another 1, the third number is 2, the fourth number in the sequence is 3, and the fifth number is 5. Can you see from the number sequence what the next number will be? In other words, what will come after 1? 1, 2, 3, 5. Just in case you can't see the pattern yet, we are going to make another generation of the diagram to help us. We will get an F for female here, M or F here, M or F on this one, F only here, 
and M or F on this one. So in the sixth generation of bees, there are eight bees. Can you see the pattern that has developed yet? Let me show you. If we add the two ones, we get two. If we then add the two and the one before it, we get three. Adding the three and the number before it, which is two, we get the next number in the sequence, which is five. If we continue with this pattern, we can predict that the next number should be 3 plus 5, which is equal to 8. So the sixth generation of bees will have 8 bees in it. If you want to check that this will continue to work, use a diagram to work out for yourself what the next numbers in the sequence of this pattern will be. Isn't it fascinating that we can find patterns everywhere? What is even more amazing is that the same number pattern is repeated in many ways in nature. The world of a pineapple skin fits this number pattern. The petals of many flowers fit this pattern. The structure of a snail's shell even fits this pattern of numbers. This sequence of numbers is called the Fibonacci sequence, bearing the name of an Italian mathematician from the 13th century who is well known for his work in algebra. But what makes the Fibonacci sequence different to the wave patterns we saw earlier? The diver had to estimate what the pattern in the wave seemed to be. He knew that his predictions could not be exactly accurate throughout the pattern. On the other hand, the Fibonacci sequence is completely predictable and we can know with certainty how the pattern continues. We found that we can add the previous two numbers each time to find the next number. Thank you for joining us, Grade 10s. Remember to look at the tasks for this section in the Numbers and Patterns Tasks video. You'll also be able to learn more on our website, www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn.